Now, as we jump into our passage this morning, man alive, what an amazing passage. It's, it's one of those passages that, that even if you're just completely unfamiliar with the Bible, most people know of this story, the story of the parting of the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 14. And it's this powerful sort of gripping story as you saw portrayed in that movie. Uh, you just feel drawn into that epic sort of adventure, this dramatic passage of the Bible. And here you have, after 430 years, you have the Israelites who have hastily uh, been ushered out of Egypt after God has revealed his power through the 10 plagues. And now they're ushered out of Egypt and they're in the wilderness and they find themselves uh, with, with the gold and the silver and the fine clothing of the Egyptians that they plundered on their way out of Egypt. And yet they find themselves in this very precarious predicament where they're backed up against the Red Sea and the Egyptian army is chasing them and, 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 and wants to kill them uh, at, the, at the edge of the Red Sea. So this is how the story unfolds. And, and one story after another in this book of Exodus, we've seen the hand of God at work. And this story is, is, is nothing less of another miracle, a display of God's glory, a display of his power. So are you ready to jump into this today? <laughs> All right. I'll take your word for that. Okay, so let's look. Turn in your Bibles to, to cha chapter 13. Because we're going to begin at the end of chapter 13 because it gives us some framework for what happens in chapter 14. So in your Bibles, uh, turn to Exodus uh, chapter 13, verse 17. And we're going to read this as we go through this morning and sort of unpack it as we go. So if you have your Bibles and your pens, take notes. That would be really helpful. So, so when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them the way of the land of the Philistines. Right? Although that was near, that was the closest way to go. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So what's going on here? Uh, what's, th this is part of the story that we often sort of look over, but I think it's important for us to understand what's happening here. So I'm going to show you a map. Okay, because this will help give you a sense of what's happening here. Now, we know that the people of Israel were in the land of Goshen. Okay, I got my, my little uh, pointer here. So that's up here. Everyone's following along. Okay, so that's the land of Goshen. So when the um, plagues were happening in Egypt, the, the people of Israel were living in the land of Goshen. They were, um, they, the plagues weren't affecting them. Now, when it says here at the end of chapter 13 that they went the way of the Philistines, this is the way of the Philistines, okay? It's called the way of Horeb. Horeb. It's called different things through the years. But it's this roadway here. It's, this is a main trade route. Now, look at how short a distance it is from Goshen all the way along here. But that's, that's not the way that God took them. He didn't take them the shortest way. He took them this way, down the edge of the Red Sea. Now, one thing you need to know about the Red Sea, and we'll see this a little later with another picture, is the Red Sea is sort of this long sea, and at the end of it are these kind of finger-like uh, parts of the Red Sea. That's what you see here, okay? The Red Sea continues on over here. But you can see at the, at the top, God does not lead the people in the way that you might expect them to go, or even in the way that they themselves would expect to go. Why would we not go to the land promised to us, the land of Canaan, in the least, uh, in, in the fastest possible way, with the least amount of trouble, in, in a, on, a, on a pathway that's already been carved out, a roadway that's important, it's an important trade route, but God does not take them that way. He, takes, he doesn't take them the way of the Philistines, the way where they'd have to go through enemy territory along the way. Now, this is an important uh, roadway for the Egyptians. This was a trade route for the Egyptians. And along this particular trade route, the Egyptians had uh, outposts along the way to protect this trade route to make sure that their goods could travel without uh, being taken. So um, God, says, God said, for lest the people change their minds when they see and return to Egypt. Now the Israelites, if there's anything we know about the Israelites so far in the story of of Exodus, we know that the Israelite people are fickle people. You know, they're for God one minute, they're not for God the next. They're, they want to rally with Moses one minute, and then they want to turn on Moses the next. And so they're fickle people. And God knows that if they go along this route and they encounter Egyptian outposts along the way, military outposts along the way, that they're going to encounter some kind of military opposition. And God knows that, that if 
if they encounter anything along the way, their hearts are gonna say, let's just go back to Egypt. Let's just call it a day and say, let's just pack it in. We're gonna go back to Egypt and we're gonna continue to be slaves. So God knows this about the people. But then he goes on in verse 18. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. All right, so again, let me show you the map so you can kind of see the way that uh, Moses led them. There should, should be a map next, yeah? Okay, so th- there's, there's, uh, there's the map there. You can see the way that, that God led them down the longest possible way. Now, it says that they are equipped for battle. So what does that mean? Does it mean that they plundered Egyptians? They took military weaponry? Perhaps it does mean that. We don't really know. The word itself is a bit of a tricky word when it's translated. The, the word equipped for battle in the ESV version is, is probably not the best uh, translation of the original text. Uh, the, the word actually means they're, they're in the formation of battle. They're, 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 they're in this formation. So they're, they're kind of walking in some sort of formation. They're marching out of the city in some sort of formation. Now, of course, we know that at this point, there's about 2.3 to 3 million of these Israelites. So just by sheer number, they would be a formidable force if they encountered something along the way. So, so we don't know if they had weapons, possibly, but what we do know is that they weren't ready for battle. We're at this place now where the Israelite people have left Egypt and uh, it's just brand new. They've left Egypt and God knows that if they encounter anything along the way, they're going to pack it in and want to go back to Egypt. Well, later on, we discover in numbers when they actually reach the promised land that God calls them to, and they they have some opposition when they reach the promised land in in, uh, the book of Numbers, in Numbers 14. As soon as they reach the promised land, after they've gone through the Red Sea, after they've seen all the plagues, after they've done seen all the wonders of God over and over and over through this journey, when they reach the promised land, and and they encounter their enemy's strength, they say, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. After all this, they get to the promised land, and even then, they're such a fickle people that they encounter resistance, and they say, well, let's just go back to Egypt. Let's just go back to Egypt. Let's run back to Pharaoh. Let's choose a leader and head back that way. Amazing, isn't it? When you consider all that they've experienced and all that they've gone through, how fickle a people they are when they reach a resistance. And it goes on, and it says in verse 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. So Joseph, right, the prince of Egypt, the, the one responsible for providing food for all the world during the famine, the, the, the son of Jacob and uh, sold by his brothers into slavery and by God's providential hand, he ends up uh, establishing the nation of Israel in Egypt, 70 people to begin with. That becomes this great multitude of, of two, two and a half to three million people. This Joseph. Now this is at the end of Genesis. We hear that Joseph uh, is passed away and he's never buried actually. His coffin is above ground. And it's, this, it's a witness uh, that this land is not their home. That they have another land. There's a promised land for them. And so Joseph is never buried in the ground. His coffin lay above the ground for 400 years. And when the Israelites leave Egypt, they take Joseph's coffin with them as sort of uh, the the promises being fulfilled, isn't it? Again, we see the promises of God being fulfilled. that, That years before, 400 years before, Joseph said, this is not your home. I don't want to be buried here because when you leave here, you take me with you. And now they're leaving and they take Joseph with with them on their journey so that he can be buried in the promised land, the, the, the land flowing with milk and honey, this rich, fertile land that God uh, wants his people to, to be established and live in as a nation. God makes promises and he fulfills those promises. We've seen that over and over in this book. And it's something important for us to hang on to every day. When God says he will, he will. Verse 20. And they moved on from Succoth, must have Succoth, and encamped at Etham, 
on the edge of the wilderness. So look at this map. This is a close-up of what, we, uh, what you just saw before. Um, okay, so now they've come down. They've come down by the Red Sea. And you can see in the picture here, uh, they, they camp in this place right up here. Okay, and um, now this, this area here is all mountainous area. Okay, so there's nowhere for them to go here. And so they come down this route and they camp up here uh, at, at, this, at this space up here. And then it goes on in verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. So during the day, they knew where they were to go because God's presence was manifest in this, this pillar that was like a cloud leading the way. You, you sort of saw that in the, in the movie there. And then by night, a pillar of fire to give them light. So they were traveling more or less day and night as God was leading them along the way. Uh, verse 22, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. So God's presence was constantly and visually before the people. He never left them. His presence was always there. Now, when you look at the book of Exodus, you're going to see this over and over. You're going to see the people of Israel turning on God when a visual presence of God is available to them. So in this case, we have a pillar of cloud to lead them by day. We have a pillar of fire to lead them by night. God's presence is there for them to see visually with their eyes, leading them along the way. Now you can imagine what they might be thinking. They're going down the edge of the Red Sea, and they're probably thinking to themselves, this doesn't seem like the route we would have chosen. Like, why are we going way down here, you know, all these days and days of traveling when we could have done something much similar? But they're trusting God to, to the extent that, that they can trust God, uh, and, and they're, they're following this pillar, and they're following this pillar of fire by night, and they're, God's presence is constantly available visually for them. We also see this later in the book of Exodus, when they're at the at the base of the, mount, of, of, of the mountain of God, and uh, Moses is in the mountain of God getting the Ten Commandments from God, and the presence of God is visually seen at the top of that mountain. And although they can visually see that, at the base of the mountain, the people of God turn on God and they build a golden calf. So over and over, you see God showing himself very plainly to them, leading them and directing them, and yet they're choosing not to acknowledge the presence of God or to follow the presence of God in some of these situations. Even though the presence of God is, is, is visually available to them, they have doubts, they, have, uh, they, they begin to rebel against God, they turn on God, they, they act as if God is not distant, is, that God is distant, when in fact he's not distant, is he? He's there right in front of them, manifests his presence in the pillar of cloud and in the pillar of fire. Now, Joshua 1.9 says this. It says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, what the cloud and the fire reveal was the very presence of God to guide his people, to lead them along the way. Here's the way you should go. Now, wouldn't it be nice? You know, who, who should I marry? Uh, what job should I take? What do I do in this situation? Or what do I do in that situation? Or how do I, how do I get through this or get through that? Have you ever sort of asked God to show himself to you in a miraculous way in these sort of big decisions of your life? Wouldn't it be really nice if, if you could go through life and you could just have a pillar of fire just leading you everywhere you went? That'd be pretty nice, wouldn't it? Well, what, what do I do here, God? Oh, the pillar of fire? I'm going that way. Done. Now, the truth is, as much as we would all like to have that kind of visual sort of pillar of fire cloud in our life, right? Where, where God just, we just follow this cloud around and God directs us every. The truth is that God gives us all the divine guidance that we would ever need. 
And he gives it in a much better way than the cloud of the pillar cloud or the pillar of fire. He gives it in a much better way. You're like, really? Really? I mean, I'd like, I'd like to have a pillar of fire lead me around. Actually, God gives us something much better than a pillar of fire to lead us in our lives. And it comes in the form of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said that the Holy Spirit dwells with you and will be in you. John 14, 17. Jesus actually said to his disciples, you know, it's better for me to go. Right? This is coming to the end of his life. And he says, it's better for me to go because the, the counselor is going to come on you, the Holy Spirit. So it's better for me to go so that you can have the Holy Spirit in you. It's better for the Holy Spirit in you than me beside you. The Bible tells us the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you in 1 Peter 4. Now, part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to help give us direction in life. And Jesus promised that the Spirit would guide us into all truth. And now by the power of, the, of his Holy Presence, God is always with us and guides us. You say, I wish I had a pillar of fire guiding my life. You have something better. You have the Holy Spirit that dwells within the Christ follower that leads us and guides us. Now, how do we recognize the guidance of the Spirit? How do we discern between our thoughts and His leading? After all, the, the Holy Spirit that doesn't speak to us like we're not walking through life and go here, turn left, you know? It's not like a Google map. He guides us through, Romans 9 tells us, through our own inner consciences. He guides us. It's one of the most important ways that we can recognize the guiding of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to be familiar with God's Word. So the Bible is the ultimate source of wisdom for how we ought to live our lives. In, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All Scripture is breathed out by God. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. All of Scripture. So as we search the Scriptures, as we know the Scriptures, as we meditate on them, as we commit Scripture to, to our memory, as, as Joshua 1 instructs us to do, as we, as we uh, use Scripture to speak to us, it reveals God's will for our lives. So there are times in your life as you grow and as you understand and deepen in your understanding of God's word, there are times in your life where the spirit of God will bring up into your life specific scriptures at times when we need them most. So knowledge of God's word helps us to discern whether or not those desires come from the Holy Spirit. So we have to we have to test our inclinations against Scripture. The Holy Spirit will never prod us to do anything contrary to God's Word. If it conflicts with the Bible, then it's not from the Holy Spirit and should be ignored. Now, it's important to note, of course, that when the Spirit of God prompts us and leads us, whether or not we accept that guidance of the Spirit. When we know the will of God, but we don't follow it, we're resisting the Spirit's life in uh, the Spirit's work in our lives. And in Acts seven fifty one, it says this: "You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did so." In First Thess First Thessalonians five nineteen, it refers to this resisting of the Spirit as the as the quenching of the Holy Spirit. Spirit's prodding you, you resist the Spirit. That's the quenching of the Spirit. And, and, and a desire to follow our own way grieves the Spirit of God. So when we say, okay, God, I, I know you want me to do this, but I actually want to do this. That's grieving of the Holy Spirit from Ephesians 4. It's choosing our own way over the Spirit's guiding in our lives. The Spirit will never lead us into sin. So when we're when we're growing in God's word and we're becoming more and more in tune with God's will, we're, we're confessing sin, we're looking and studying God's word, we're, 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 we're repenting, we're, we're following the Spirit's leading. 
in this particular story, they have this very visual way to see God's leading for the people of Israel. And yet in our own lives, we have the Spirit of God that's prompting and leading us as we grow in our understanding of Scripture. The Spirit of God uses that to lead us. So it's much better for us to have the Holy Spirit in us than to have a cloud of fire or a, cl- a cloud of pillar of cloud out here to follow along. The Spirit of God is at work in us. The Spirit of God dwells within us. The Spirit of God guides us into all truth. Chapter 14, again, this is, this is the, the, the actual recounting of the parting of the Red Sea. So let's look at this. And it begins with God giving even more directions to his people. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and camp in front of pi I don't know how you say that, but anyway. I say it confidently and quickly. That's the way you do that. Okay, so between Migdal and the sea in front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. Wait, let me just pause there. If we can go back to that map. I don't know if I have a copy of that map next. but So, so here you go. So, so what's God saying here? God is saying... Go from where you're camping and come down here across from this. This is Baal Zephon. And, and I want you to camp here. All right. So God's instructed them to come back. Now, remember, this is all mountainous here. There's nowhere they can go here. And it's wilderness up here. So God leads them to camp right here. And this is where God does this miracle of the parting of the Red Sea. Verse 3. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them and I will get glory over Pharaoh and his and all his hosts and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord and they did so. Okay. So again, you see this map, you see the situation. This is a, this is a dire situation they're in. They have nowhere to go. Mountains on one side, wilderness on the other and the Red Sea uh, on the other side of them. They're trapped. So naturally, Pharaoh takes advantage of this, right? I mean, you probably would too if you were him. You're like, oh, you're thinking to yourself, they've just left. They've plundered everything. They have the finest clothes in Egypt. They've taken it with them. Who is going to serve us? Who's going to finish the, the magnificent monuments that the Israelites started? Who, what, we don't like this plan. We don't like not having servants, So Pharaoh rallies his army. He gets 600 chariots. This is one of the most modern armies of the day. And he takes these 600 chariots rumbling along the ground and he's pursuing the Israelites as they're encamped by the sea. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Listen to this, okay? Just listen to what they said. Is it because there's no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Hello. What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you when we were in Egypt? Leave us alone that we might serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Wow. Wow. I read this and I'm angry with them. I mean, imagine what God's like. God's like, oh man, these people are driving me crazy. I I mean, I've showed them everything. I've delivered them out of Egypt and still they encounter some kind of resistance and they just want to go back. Like Like a dog to its own vomit. Now, it makes sense that they're fearful. There's 600 chariots rumbling towards them. And, 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 and they, 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 they look on one side, they see the sea, and look at the other, and they see Pharaoh's army coming at them. They have seemingly no chance for escape. But notice the attitude of the Israelites. They go from defiantly leaving Egypt, celebrating, plundering Egypt, to questioning God at the first sign of danger. Yeah, they're trapped. But what but what do they have that they can see? Come on, help me out here. What how do they see God? 
the pillars. So, so here they see the Egyptians coming at them. And yet at the same time, they have the presence of God manifest before them in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And what do they choose? Let's go back to Egypt. Let's pack it in. Yeah, yeah, I know all the plagues and stuff, but let's just go back and serve the Egyptians. They're not one week out of Egypt and they're already, they've already distorted the past. They're thinking it's better for them to be in Egypt than it really was. Now, what's interesting about the book of Exodus is what the Bible tells us Exodus is all about that, that in Exodus, there are examples upon examples for us to learn from. In 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 6, here's what it says. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were, were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Right, this is in the New Testament now. This is after Jesus' is, is his death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 5, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. The particular example that we see in Exodus 14 is what happens, is an example for us of what happens when God rescues his people from bondage. So when God rescues you and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, what ensues is a fierce spiritual battle for your soul. Now, anyone who tells you that committing your life to Christ makes your life easier is not telling you the truth. Fulfilling, yes. More joyful, absolutely. But easier, no. In some ways, life gets more difficult after we become Christ followers because the struggle for sin is so much more pronounced, for one thing. So Satan is always trying to, to, to tempt us to give up and to go back. Satan's always seeking to snatch you away. And the battle for your soul is so intense and so ongoing. And, and the way so often that the enemy draws us away is very, uh, very slow usually. It's like, you know, you're, you're part of God's local church, you're part of the church, and you're involved, and then, then, then you start to become less, and then you look up, and there's a cloud in the sky, and you think to yourself, it's going to rain. I can't go to church. And so then, then you don't go to church, and then week after week, you find yourself not involved in the community of God, not learning together, not engaged in what he's doing. See, the enemy draws us away in these sort of uh, slow fades, The battle for your soul is intense and it's ongoing. And the enemy is trying to snatch you away. Now, you can expect, of course, that the closer you are to Jesus, the greater the spiritual battle you're going to face. But of course, the closer you are, the greater you'll be able to stand firm in the midst of that battle. Now, Jesus taught about this in the New Testament in Matthew 13. And he said, he said this, he said, when people hear the message of salvation, the evil one right, comes and snatches away what has been sown in their hearts. A spiritual battle ensues. He snatches away what has been sown in their hearts. And others fall away from persecution. And others fall away from the troubles of life. Or like the uh, Israelites, the first sign of trouble. Oh God, where are you? I'm out of here. I'm, I'm going back to Egypt. There's a spiritual battle going on and the enemy is at war for your soul. Now remember that the kingdom of God, uh, that in the kingdom of God, uh, once God has set us free, the enemy has no right to take us back. So what should we do in the midst of uh, the spiritual battle that inevitably every Christ follower encounters in our lives? Do we cry out in fear or, and turn on our leaders like the Israelites did? No, we don't cry out in fear. We cry out in faith. What's the most baffling 
when I read this story over and over is the willingness of the Israelites to go back into bondage. To go back into slavery. They told Moses, wouldn't it have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness? Wow. The whole point of the Exodus was for them to serve God, but here they are wanting to go right back and serve Pharaoh. This was more than a loss of nerve. This was a loss of faith. By pledging their allegiance to Pharaoh, they're denying the power of God. The psalmist writes about this in Psalm 106 and says that they rebelled by the Red Sea. They rebelled against God at the Red Sea. They said, oh, it's getting tough. I'm out. I'm out. Now, when we're tempted, we often do the same thing. We decide to follow Jesus, and then we encounter problems in our lives. We're struggling with this or that, or something bad happens in our lives. And, and what, what do we so often do is we go back to our old, old ways of coping. Rather than turning to Jesus in faith, we, we go back to you know, the old ways of, of anger or addiction or depression or distraction or whatever it is. No matter how much we used to hate it, there's a security in the way that we used to live. So we return to the same harmful friendships, the same old sinful attitudes, the same old nasty habits that we had before. So as easy as it is to think about the Israelites and the way that they so quickly turned when, at, when, when uh, um, problems came in their life, really, friends, we do the same thing. But listen to what Moses says in verse 13. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. Wow. Anybody here seen the... uh, or familiar with the Battle of Dunkirk, World War II? Maybe you've seen the movie. In the Battle of Dunkirk, the, the Allied forces, the, the Commonwealth countries, France, were, were pushed by the German army um, from France. They were, they were being pushed against the English Channel, uh, on the beach of the English Channel, and they had no way of escape. Um, very similar situation here, really. The Israelites are pressed up against the Red Sea, the, the Allied forces were pressed up against the English Channel during the, the, the Battle of Dunkirk, and the German forces were coming uh, rapidly upon them, and they had nowhere to go. So what happened at the Battle of Dunkirk was the largest evacuation ever in, in history. 338,000 uh, troops were, were taken by boats of various sizes, some fishing boats, some very small boats, some big uh, military uh, ships were taken across the English Channel to safety. But man, it was crazy. It was a crazy time for those uh, on that beach thinking, we have nowhere to go. The Germans are closing in. We're all going to be slaughtered on this beach. Now imagine with me, you're in that situation. And and, and rather than evacuating the troops, the uh, the Admiral uh, Bertrand Ramsey stands on the back of a Jeep with a loudspeaker and he stands before you all and all the troops and he says to them, men, women, you fought well. You fought well. Here's what we're going to do to move forward. We're going to do nothing. We're not going to do anything. In fact, We're just going to be silent and watch. Um, No thanks. I'll I'll just risk it. I'll just try swimming across. You see, in essence, this is exactly what Moses told the people. He said, watch the salvation of the Lord for you today. Watch and see what the Lord is going to do today. What do you have to do? Be silent. Be silent. And watch. The Battle of Dunkirk, Winston Churchill declared this the the miracle of deliverance. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? 
the miracle of deliverance. Now, as amazing as that evacuation was in World War II, it doesn't hold a candle to what God did at the edge of the Red Sea. The Lord will fight for you, and all you have to do is to be silent, and you need to stand, and you need to watch. This is the greatest miracle of deliverance ever. The Lord was fighting for them. The Lord was going to save them. He was their warrior, and all that they needed to do was stand and watch their salvation. In this battle, they weren't soldiers. In this battle, they were spectators. The same holds true for our salvation from sin. The enemy is pursuing us, but instead of running away, we need to, all we need to do is we need to stand and see the salvation of our God. And once we put our faith in Jesus, we stand our ground. We're in a spiritual battle, and, and in that battle, the Bible gives us some arch, marching orders that Moses gave to Israel. Therefore, in Ephesians 6, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. In our struggle, we need to take our stand with Jesus, who is our warrior and who is our salvation. Now, it, have you ever noticed when, we, when you read the, uh, the, uh, the, the armor of God, whose armor is it? It's God's armor. It's not yours. God's armor is available to you. God is your salvation. It's not you. You just muster up whatever you need to battle Satan because you can't do it. You need the armor of God on you. And when you come to Christ, we put the armor of God on us and we watch God work salvation. Now it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to be still. It's hard to wait for God. Our our temptation is to to run away and to fear and to try to fix everything on our own. And yet God is our defender and he's our champion and he instructs us to stand firm. Put on the armor of God. When we're caught between the desert and the sea, we need to be still and look for his salvation. Trusting God is difficult, but trusting God is essential. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in after them and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So what's happening here is the presence of God manifest in these, this visual picture of these pillars has moved from in front of them behind them to separate the Egyptians from the Israelites. So the Israelites can cross the Red Sea and the Egyptians can't go anywhere because the presence of God is manifest there. Now you'd think, wouldn't you? I mean, you would think to yourself, if you're an Egyptian, you'd be pulling up to that, a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud circling around to prevent you from going anywhere. And you'd be like, eh, not feeling it. I think I'll just turn around. But no, they were resolved to go after the Israelites. There was this cloud of darkness and this cloud that separated them. It lit up the night without one coming near the other all night long. And we know what happens next. Moses stretches out his hand. God divides the sea and they cross over this section that you saw on the map. This is what most people think that that, uh, based on scripture that the Israelites crossed and they crossed over this section on dry land. And when the, when the Israelites went, got close to the other side, the pillar, 
the two pillars uh, disappeared and the Egyptians went full force towards the uh, Israelites in the, the dry ground of the bed of the Red Sea. And as they were in the middle of the bed of the Red Sea, God creates confusion. He creates, the wheels start falling off their chariots. They're kind of, kind of like confused what's happening here. They, they can't seem to make progress. The reason for that is to allow the Israelites to complete their journey across, but also to ensure that the Egyptians can't escape as the waters begin to, to pour out on them. And, and, and they get to the other side, and Moses uh, stretches out his hands, and the waters come crashing down and destroys all the Egyptians. And you see the power of God and the glory of God revealed in this. And chapter 14 ends with this in verse 30. Thus, the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Well, isn't that a turn of events? Just, just shortly before that, it's like, let's go back to Egypt. They turn on Moses. Moses, we don't trust you anymore. We don't want to follow you anymore. Let's go back. And, and now you think, do you really think that the parting of the Red Sea was enough for them? Well, history will show us it wasn't. Sadly, Israel didn't stay in that place of respect and fear of the Lord or faith toward the Lord. There was probably more of a, a circumstantial feeling uh, of the situation than, than true faith because very quickly they turn on God and on Moses again. And they cry out to go back to Egypt. Through, through Exodus, you do see at times God's frustration with the Israelites. Like, no kidding, right? No kidding. Well, what are some uh, reminders, some things that we can hang on to as we sort of think about this passage? One of them is this, friends, that we need to hang on to. There's no shortcuts with God. There's no shortcuts with God. The short way and the quick way are not always the best way. God had a plan for these people, and the plan was to reveal to them his glory, and that meant to do that was to take a different path that they would have naturally taken themselves. Never forget that God sometimes takes us on a longer more difficult journey to prepare us for his ultimate best. In these times, if we let him, God, God uses these times to build our character, to teach us about trusting in him, to prepare us for what he has for us. There's no shortcuts with God. Think about Moses' life. How long was he in the wilderness before God uh, used him and made him ready to deliver Israel. 40 years. He wandered in the wilderness with his wife, Zipporah, tending to sheep for 40 years. From the time Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus in the book of Acts in the New Testament, it was about 10 years after that experience that Paul ever preached his first sermon. You have to be confident, friends, that God has not abandoned you when you pray for something and the matter isn't resolved by dinner time. Some of you uh, are familiar with uh, some of Tim Keller's writings. He passed away uh, not too long ago, but he was almost 60 years old before he wrote his first book. See, the shortest way is not always the best way. You can't microwave your walk with Jesus. Sometimes it's the journey that God uses to transform us into what he wants us to be. It's the trials and the tribulations of those journeys to which God is using, using to transform us and to make us into what he has next for us, what he's doing in us, and what he's doing through us. There's no shortcuts with God. Secondly, Jesus promised that his Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. We need to hang on to that reality. The Spirit of God is guiding us. It's His power. It's His holy presence. God is always with us, and God is always guiding us. He's leading us. It's hard to, to realize that, though, when, when you're on this journey. God's taking you on a journey, and He's doing something in and through you, because we just want it done 
immediate. Like we have this sort of this sort of like five minute faith kind of idea. Like if God doesn't work right now, I'm out. But God is working in and through your circumstances. So when we're in tune, when we're growing in our faith and we're confessing sin, when we're part of the local body of Christ, when we have a habit of prayer and studying his word, the spirit, the spirit leads us, he guides us, and we can understand what the spirit's doing in and through us. The third thing is, is, is Satan's always tempting us to give up and turn back to the past. Always trying to snatch us away. And the battle for our soul is pretty intense. It's ongoing. We don't cry out in fear or turn on our leaders. We, we cry out in faith. Now sometimes, and this may be someone here, sometimes uh, some people can't break free from, the, from a bad past. So they rehearse over and over and over. For some, it seems as though they're, they're strangely comforted by the past, whether that's good or bad, as the Israelites were. Let's just go back to what we know. Some people don't move on from their good past either. They're, they're, they're constantly living for the glory days. Right? You've met these people. Right? You went to high school with them. And it's not 10 years after high school, and it seems like they never got out of high school. Some people don't move on from their good past because they want to relive the glory days. They're holding on to you. There's this likelihood that the, the, the good past will never repeat itself again, isn't there? So no matter whether or not, friends, you're stuck in the good past or bad past or whatever it is, the potential exists, whether it's good or bad, the potential exists for you to be robbed for what God is doing now in your life. To be, robbed, to be robbed of the future that he has for you because you're always looking at life in the rearview mirror. You're always looking to the past. A good question to ask ourselves, even as families, is, is, is when you gather together, you know, around the dinner table, is to ask one another, where have you seen an evidence of God's grace today? Because believe it or not, God's at work today. No, yes, God's been working in the past, but God's working today. In Luke 9, 62, Jesus said, he said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. It's this idea we need to move forward. Paul talked about this, uh, to, talked about this as well in, in uh, Philippians 3. He says, now that I have already obtained this, nor not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal to the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Moving on from the past means discovering and celebrating what God is doing in the present. It doesn't mean we can't be sentimental or, or celebrate the past. We can't get stuck in a place where we miss what God is doing now. Things weren't like they used to be. You know, that kind of thinking. Satan is pursuing us, but instead of running away, we need to stand firm and we need to see the salvation of the Lord. Where's the evidence of God's grace in your life today? We move forward. We don't forget what God has done. God doesn't call us to forget. He calls us to remember. But we can't live in the past. We have to strive forward for what God is doing in our lives today. And the fourth thing, and the thing that we see over and over in this book as we close this morning, is that God is passionate for his own glory. Why did God lead them on this route? You know, why did he choose the hardest way possible? Why did God part the Red Sea? The answer to that explains why God does everything that he has ever done, is doing right now, and will ever do. And the answer is for his glory. Before the people even reached the Red Sea, God said to Moses in verse 4, I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. God is glorified when the Egyptians faced judgment and were punished for their sins. God is glorified in that. 
God is glorified when he judges people for their sins because this displays his divine attribute of justice. Through the plagues, God was judging the idol gods of the Egyptians for his glory and for the praise of his justice. God is passionate about his glory. Romans 11.36 says, From him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. To him be glory forever. Amen. In Exodus 14, this amazing chapter ends with this note. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Notice the order here. God did not wait for his people to trust him before he would save them. If he'd waited for that to happen, oh man, they never would have been saved. Instead, God took the initiative. First, the people saw their salvation just as Moses promised. Then they feared and believed. This is the pattern and the purpose of salvation. First, first God delivers us from danger, saving us when we can't save ourselves. Then we respond in faith, trusting God and worshiping him. As we think about Christmas, you know, that's coming in a matter of weeks, so coming so fast. As we think about that, we're reminded of God's salvation to us, that God sent his son to us as a babe in a manger for the purpose of salvation. The, Jesus came as a babe to die. That's what he came to do, to give us salvation. And in that salvation, the salvation that we couldn't get for ourselves, in that salvation that only Jesus could do, we respond in faith to what he did. We trust him and we worship him because he is worthy of our glory. And he alone is worthy of our glory. So let's pray. Father, wow, what an, what an amazing scripture this morning, Lord. And, and thank you, Father, for teaching us this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would give us a humble and contrite heart as we think about Maybe the ways that the Spirit of God is, is, is tapped on our own hearts this morning. Maybe there's some of us this morning who are just consistently living in the past and fail to see the evidences of your grace in the everyday, in the present. Give us eyes to see, Lord, all that you're doing. Give us a faith to be able to stand firm in the midst of opposition in the midst of whatever troubles in life we may encounter where we have the temptation to sort of turn back and to run the other direction lord help us to stand firm and to know that the armor is not our armor it's your armor and we put on your armor we can stand against the arrows of the enemy so god give us that confidence give us that assurance lord thank you for this story and what it means to us this morning lord in your name amen